So hello everyone and welcome. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We're going to give like a minute or so for folks to join. Um, so if you're just joining us, uh, uh, please do keep your microphone muted if it's not muted. Uh, we have a really outstanding attendance today and we're really happy to have you with us. Um, again, we're just um, waiting for some folks to make sure they get their computer aligned and their cameras, etc. While we're waiting, if you haven't done this already, you can change your name in Zoom. Sometimes, uh, I don't know, your uh, son or daughter or your spouse use the computer and it says a different name. Um, if you click on your own picture in the three dots in the upper right hand corner, you can drop down and go where it says rename and actually type in your name. Um, so this way, if we go to a question, we can refer to who you are. In addition, we'll be taking questions, um, as many of you probably experienced recently, in the chat box, which is available on the bottom bar. If you press the bubble where it says chat, um, then you can ask your question there. If you don't see that, um, sometimes there's three dots in the bottom bar. You have to mouse over um, and then select more, and then you'll see that chat box. So again, um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Ed Potosnik, and I am executive director of the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today with our partners at Rethink Energy and LCV as we hear from Senator Booker and Chairman Frank Pallone about environmental action post-election. Um, unfortunately, due to a last minute scheduling issue, Senator Menendez was unable to provide a recording as we had hoped, but of course, we're gonna to continue to look forward to working with him as he is a champion for the climate and addressing climate change and environmental action. Uh, we have a great program for you all today. Um, a little bit about New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. We are a nonpartisan tax deductible nonprofit that protects our natural resources by raising awareness around key environmental challenges. And we work to increase the efficacy of the entire environmental community by being a convener within uh, the environmental movement. Again, if you're just joining us, if you can click the three dots um, and rename yourself in the upper right hand corner, and then just uh, so we know what your actual name is, and that'll help with the questioning. And then if you have a question, just click in the chat and it'll pop up a little window and you can place your question um, there. Um, and that's how we're gonna be taking questions today. Um, as many of us know, uh, nearly two weeks have passed since the general election on November 3rd. And while we're still awaiting some final results, we do have the major headlines. In fact, on my uh, table here in my makeshift office at home, I have this headline um, uh, from, what was this, uh, on November 8th, um, from Sunday, November 8th, after the election was called by uh, the major, all the major news networks um, for uh, Vice President Biden winning the presidential uh, election um, with 306 electoral votes currently, that's how many he has, and nearly 5 million popular votes in the lead. The Senate is currently at 48 Democrats and 50 Republicans with two runoffs in early January in Georgia that will determine the final makeup of the United States Senate. And we have uh, Democrats in a majority in the House after a very tough election year. And here in New Jersey, we just had some local races, which are really important. Um, and, uh, you know, separately, New Jersey LCV did support candidates uh, with great success at the local level. But the state Senate, state assembly, they're not up again until next year. Um, so knowing these results today, um, we have a great program and I'm very excited uh, for it. Again, if you have a question at any time, put it in the chat box. If you're able to change your name, uh, click the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and type in your name. That's going to be really helpful. And I get to hand it over now to uh, a great colleague of mine, Tom Gilbert from Rethink Energy, to begin the conversation. Thanks very much, Ed, and thank you all for joining. My name is Tom Gilbert, and I'm the campaign director for Rethink Energy New Jersey and the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. And Rethink Energy New Jersey's mission is to transition New Jersey away from fossil fuels to clean, renewable sources of energy that are appropriately cited. And I want to thank um, Ed and all of our great partners at New Jersey LCV and, and LCV for for joining with us uh, on this webinar series, uh, which is about New Jersey's leadership on clean energy and the climate crisis. 
And we know from recent polling um, that New Jersey voters are very concerned about climate change and they overwhelmingly support moving to a clean energy future. And New Jersey has been making great strides on climate change and clean energy uh, at the state level, thanks to uh, Governor Murphy and our legislative leaders. And I know that we're all uh, anxious to say the least and, and hopeful for more progress in Washington, thanks to the continued leadership of our congressional delegation and a new administration. We are so fortunate to have Chairman Pallone and Senator Booker with us, uh, not just today, but always. They have been steadfast leaders on climate change, clean energy, and environmental protection uh, in Congress for, for many years. And we wanna uh, obviously uh, congratulate both of you on your, uh, on your recent reelection. So we're gonna start with some opening remarks from each of them followed by Q and A. And we'll begin with uh, Chairman Pallone, who has been uh, serving uh, us in Congress since 1988. And he chairs the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the key committee dealing with these climate and energy issues. He's been a staunch defender of New Jersey's coastal waters from offshore drilling and a pr proponent of offshore wind. Um, just this year, he led House passage of uh, the Clean Energy Jobs and Innovation Act, which authorizes major investments in the transition to a low carbon future, and it lays the groundwork for comprehensive climate legislation. We also appreciate that um, his committee has held hearings on the many problems with FERC's review of natural gas pipelines, with, uh, uh, more than a few of those in New Jersey, uh, including the Penny's pipeline and the Nessie pipeline. Um, and uh, that you bring attention to the need to protect landowners from the abuse of eminent domain by pipeline developers, such as the legislation proposed by Congressman Malinowski. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, Chairman, and for all of your efforts. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Tom, and, and thank you, Ed, and thank you to all of you from the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. I mean, we've had a tough time over the last four years with President Trump, but you guys have uh, been a great partner in, in holding uh, the Trump administration accountable and, and trying to prevent some of the, you know, backsliding and lack of enforcement and, you know, that's been typical of the uh, Trump administration. Um, but we still have a couple more months with Trump. And uh, what I really wanted to talk about today, because I don't want to monopolize, I know we had to take, take questions, is um, what we can do in the, in the lame duck. And then, of course, what we will do with the new Biden Harris administration, and I, you know, I can't uh, stress enough what a change this will be, uh, because both Biden and Harris have really been environmental champions. Um, Vice President Biden under Obama, and certainly Kamala Harris uh, as a as an environmental justice champion. You know, uh, both in the Senate as when as also when she was the California um, AG. Um, but so, so let's talk a little bit about the lame duck. You already brought up the, um, the energy package, which passed the House, is in the Senate. The Senate also uh, reported a bill out of committee, but haven't uh, passed a bill in the Senate. So we are going to try to move this energy package in the lame duck session. Um, and the bill that came out of the Senate does have some good overlap on things like energy efficiency, uh, also on HFCs. HFCs, as you know, uh, I guess that comes out of Senator Booker's committee. Uh, he, so he may talk a little bit about that. But that was added to the bill that came out of, uh, uh, out of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And so we're hoping that we can certainly get some provisions related to energy efficiency and HFCs uh, if we can get a consensus on this energy package in the lame duck. It also has some very strong environmental justice provisions, but they, that may be harder with the, uh, with the Republicans in charge in the Senate. In addition to that, you mentioned, uh, Tom, the uh, pipeline, the pipeline safety bill. We're still hoping we can do that uh, in the uh, lame duck. Uh, WERDA uh, has some things that you probably care about, the Water Resource Development Act. So, you know, I, I want to stress uh, you know, I don't want to have high hopes for the lame duck, but I do think that these are some things that we can do. Now, of course, when now, now when we talk about a new administration, the Biden-Harris administration, of course, is a total change. Uh, you know, reliance on science didn't exist under Trump. Enforcement didn't exist under Trump. They tried whenever possible through executive orders or, uh, or rule changes 
uh, to weaken all the environmental uh, laws. I think the main thing I would stress is, of course, you know, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. If we can take those two Georgia seats and have a majority 50-50 in the Senate, then we can pass a lot of legislation. But absent that, and, you know, we won't know till January, uh, you know, legislation is going to be more difficult than uh, executive orders and regulations. So where, uh, where um, Trump, you know, passed executive orders or, or, or regulations that weakened or went in the wrong direction on environmental issues, those can be simply overturned by Biden. And that's crucial. Certainly enforcement uh, is gonna be much better. But so many uh, laws, whether it was fuel, of, you know, whether it was fuel standards or it was, uh, you know, even things like electric light bulbs, you know, that the Trump administration took the ax to, all those can be changed by executive order. Uh, and, and I expect they will be. Uh, but, um, but on things that need legislative action, uh, it's going to be more difficult if the Senate doesn't flip and become 50-50 with those Georgia races. But I wanted to mention a few things. I mean, obviously, the first thing out of the box that, the, that Biden mentioned was the Paris Agreement, that he's going to rejoin that the day he's inaugurated on January 20th. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is, you know, if you look at the kind of legislation that uh, we passed in the House the last uh, two years, these are the things we would try to move. So we would try to move an infrastructure bill, right, which has a lot of things for safe drinking water, for brownfields. We would try to move a Superfund bill and bring, and bring back the Superfund Trust Fund. Uh, with regard to climate action, obviously we would like to do a comprehensive climate action bill to reduce greenhouse gases and go along with the Paris Agreement. And if you look at the Clean Future Act, which is the bill that we drafted in our committee, you can get an idea of what a comprehensive bill would look like that deals with an electricity standard, industrial sector, transportation sector, power sector, and whatever. But obviously that's gonna be hard to do without having a Senate uh, that's majority Republican. And the last thing I wanna mention in the interest of time, although the interior issues are not in my committee, you know I care a lot about them. You already mentioned that. So, uh, you know, um, obviously on offshore drilling, uh, the Trump administration refused to permit any offshore drilling permits. I think that changes dramatically under Biden. The five-year plan that prohibited offshore drilling that was done by Obama and Biden in 2017 is still intact because you and others were so successful in not allowing, uh, or the courts didn't allow it to be overturned, but we'd have to think about that coming up again too, because I think that goes from 2017 to 2022. So we'd have to, you know, hopefully get the administration to move forward with another five-year plan that prohibits offshore drilling in the Atlantic and elsewhere. But on a lot of other agency things, you know, like Tosca, uh, I think you can you'll start to see some decisions out of EPA on high-profile chemicals, uh, PFAS as well. These are all things that can be done by executive order or rulemaking. So. I think that's a very positive, I mean, the most important thing was to elect uh, Biden and Harris. You guys helped accomplish that. There's a lot of very positive things to look forward to in this new administration. So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Ed. Thank you, Congressman, we really appreciate it. I wanna see if Senator Booker was able to rejoin. I know he was having some uh, Wi-Fi issues, um, which is, I think, second to the most common thing in our new virtual office environment to you're muted. You're muting you know, when you tell someone they're doing. Um, so Senator Booker, if you're there, if you can give a quick shout out, we can be very flexible um, when he gets, uh, gets that working again. So one of the things that you had mentioned um, around legislation, and maybe this is something we wanna follow up with Senator Booker when he, when he, when he gets on with us though. Uh, you know, in my mind, the two uh, Senate seats um, are critical for Democrats remaining control. But at New Jersey LCV, you know, we support anyone who supports the environment. And I think a lot of our members believe that this shouldn't be a partisan issue. And we can have a whole long conversation around how things have seemingly gotten um, partisan around environmental issues. Um, but, you know, what are the prospects in the U.S. Senate for conservation allies to emerge within the Republican caucus to join the 48 Democrats or whatever the number ends up being um, to take some steps 
um, probably likely bold steps like um, Senator Romney or, um, you know, Senator Collins, um, you know, folks that have had, you know, a, a past of standing up and protecting natural resources and taking action to reduce uh, pollution in, in our air related to greenhouse gas emissions and, and et cetera. What are, you know, what are your, um, your thoughts there? I don't, is that uh, Senator Booker that joined us on the phone? I, I hope so. Can you guys hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Um, so I was just asking, uh, we're going to give you a chance to share some comments, but I was asking sort of this idea, like we're waiting on the, uh, and for, first of all, Senator Booker, thanks for joining us, for being uh, tenacious through the technology. Uh, we're really glad to have you. And we will have an introduction in a moment for you to uh, share some thoughts. But we were just asking the question, you know, are there some other allies in the Senate from the Republican caucus on environmental issues um, that could come along um, and move the pro-conservation agenda forward in the best interest of our children and grandchildren? Uh, what are people's thoughts around that, Congressman? Uh, I'll give it to you first, and then uh, Senator. Oh, you're asking me first instead of Senator Booker? I didn't. Well, ask Senator that. Booker first. Okay. How's that? Any any thoughts on that, Senator? Yeah, sure. I'll skip my introductory comments. I'm I'm sorry. I first got on a video, but my Wi-Fi was not strong enough. I'm in the road heading down to D.C. as we speak. Uh, but obviously, I want to thank everyone from the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, uh, just really the whole team, Rethink Energy New Jersey, and 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 more. Um, I, I, I'm very sobered, frankly, about, number one, uh, getting anything done in the lame duck uh, of uh, significance. I think I heard, I heard um, most of uh, uh, Congressman Pallone's uh, remarks, uh, and he's right that there may be some e efforts around our energy, the energy bill. Um, but we, we have to uh, really think about our ambitions around the environment in, as far as it relates to Mitch McConnell. Uh, finding allies and finding people to work with on issues. There are some really good colleagues of mine on the Republican side who believe that we need to get something done. And I'm going to continue, along with some of my other colleagues, uh, to work on those things. The challenge will always be Mitch McConnell and him in control of the, uh, of the Senate uh, really puts a damper on a lot of my ambitions uh, going into this election thinking that we would be in the majority. And again, I'm not discounting um, the uphill challenge, but still the possibility of Georgia. Uh, but I'm very sobered about our ability to get anything substantive done um, uh, through, uh, through the Senate. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that the, the, that the Biden White House will be able to do that will help us in our efforts. Um, but what is needed right now is a significant uh, in, uh, uh, sort of step on environmental uh, or climate change legislation, environmental justice legislation, and more. And Mitch McConnell has proven himself to be an ardent opponent uh, to those efforts. Uh, so uh, as, as we stand right now, we really have uh, uh, that challenge in terms of doing anything broad. Now, we can rack up a lot of wins on other larger bills that have to pass from uh, uh, infrastructure bills that are going to come, WERDA we know uh, is going to come. Uh, and there are some other efforts to do horse trading uh, around, uh, you know, renewable tax credits and more. Uh, but I do want to just put everybody uh, on notice, if, if, you, if you aren't already, which I imagine you are, is that a McConnell-controlled Senate is going to make things very difficult to get done. Thank you for that. That's a lot of questions on people's mind around why can't folks just work together if it's a close majority. But what you're saying is, McConnell's the gatekeeper for what goes to the floor. And as long as he continues to have that position of leadership, the things we care about are not gonna make it to the floor, even if there are Republicans that join with Democrats to support them. We, then that, that is yeah. sobering. Yeah, it's, it's very sobering. And, I, and I'm not saying, again, um, uh, I've been able to get a lot of bipartisan bills done, but they're usually things that don't amount to major issues for uh, McConnell. And, and again, there is a large part of his caucus that denies uh, that climate change is a problem or an issue. And most of his concern starting after the Georgia race is going to be his 20, uh, is going to be his 2022 20, uh, elections. And issues of, uh, 
uh, you know, in, in states like Pennsylvania, for example, which will be one of the battleground states, uh, the oil industry uh, and, and uh, uh, natural gas industries and others uh, are going to have a lot of, of uh, to dictate to him about that election and more. So his, you've got to think of his psychology as protecting his most precious thing, which is his majority. And um, a lot of the ways he gets a lot of the dark money into the campaigns, the way he was able to fight back on a lot of the competitive races we saw was because of his incredible fundraising coming from uh, folks like the Koch brothers and others. So you, you've just got to keep that in mind uh, in terms of setting expectations. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, many of us won't try to continue uh, to fight in the Senate uh, trenches. Uh, and create the kind of bipartisanship to try to pressure him. But we have to think of this as a larger movement uh, uh, to make the cost of inaction uh, politically greater uh, greater uh, than the costs he'll have to pay with some of his interest groups for moving ahead and doing something significant. Great. I'm going to put it back to Tom. Tom had an introduction for you as well. I want to make sure people understand um, the critical role you play in the United States Senate on these environmental issues. So, Tom. Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator, so much for joining us. And uh, we wanted to congratulate you on your re-election. Re and um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Booker, who's been serving in the U.S. Senate since 2013. Uh, he sits on the Environment and Public Works Committee. And um, uh, we are pleased to see we'll be joining the Senate leadership team as vice chairman of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee in the 117th Congress. Um, and we noted in the announcement, Senator, that uh, you highlighted climate change and environmental justice as among your legislative priorities. And we know that you've been a very strong advocate for addressing both of those issues. Um, also wanted to highlight, um, as part of your leadership on climate change, the Senator introduced the Climate Stewardship Act of 2019, inspired by FDR's New Deal programs to advance climate friendly practices on over 100 million acres of farmland, plant more than 15 billion trees, to restore deforested landscapes and expand urban tree cover, to reestablish the Civilian Conservation Corps and to restore over 2 million acres of coastal wetlands. Um, and this is a, a very exciting initiative um, and, and we share your view that natural solutions can play an important role in addressing climate change. And along with clean energy investments, provide enormous opportunities to create jobs at a time when millions of Americans are in need of work. So, Senator, uh, we, we thank you so much for, for all that you do and for being with us here today. Uh, I, I'm grateful uh, to be on and uh, just so appreciate so many folks who are such strong allies on uh, everything from uh, the, the, the legislation you just mentioned, my Climate Stewardship Act, all the way to the people on this call who helped me write the environmental justice uh, bill uh, uh, that that uh, is sort of the dominant one in the Senate. So I'm just grateful again to be on the call, and I'm sorry uh, uh, that it is such sobering times for us that really thought that a lot of this legislation would move in dramatic fashion uh, under a, a Democratic-controlled Senate. Um, uh, there are so many issues, and we all know the climate uh, issues and environmental justice issues touch upon everything from. Uh, our health and well-being and health systems all the way to uh, racial justice in our country. Uh, this is all interwoven and interconnected, uh, these issues. And uh, it's a time of, of real frustration for many of us in the Senate uh, as, as we continue to work on what is going to be an uphill battle in Georgia, but the hopes that we can so find some pathway in the next two years uh, to bring some of this common sense legislation uh, 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 really to bear. I mean, there is some good news in the fact that, you know, even a Fox News poll uh, uh, found that 70 percent of voters uh, in the last election supported increased government spending on green and renewable energy. That's promising. Uh, and 77 percent, 72 percent of voters in the last election said they were concerned about climate change. So we know that we are winning uh, in terms of the larger public sentiment. We now have to find ways to translate that into the kind of bold uh, uh, legislation, and I would say also common sense legislation, uh, to create greater justice in our country and, and to save our planet. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the 
one of the thoughts that comes to mind sort of as we're looking ahead at the federal level, um, you know, here from New Jersey is, you know, we've had a lot of great action um, from Governor Murphy and legislative leaders moving rapidly towards a clean energy future that, you know, we're hoping will inspire the national level to sort of raise the bar for federal action. Um, but one area that, you know, and it, it clearly um, there's some things hinging in the balance with control of the Senate hearing that loud and clear. But one area that has, um, you know, pretty wide support is offshore wind. And, uh, you know, is there anything uh, sort of thinking ahead either to lame duck or into the next Congress for tax credits around wind or solar projects? I think, um, you know, President Biden or Vice President Biden, President-elect Biden had talked about ending subsidies for oil and gas industry over $2 billion a year and maybe repurposing those. That's not something he talked about into wind and solar projects. Is there any, um, you know, you know, thoughts around that as a potential solution? I don't know about uh, Congressman Pallone, you want to jump in there? Well, I know that we did have a uh, difficult, you know, of course, it's in ways and means the taxes rather than in energy and commerce, but we did have difficulty um, getting support for some of that um, in the last session. Um, you know, and again, it does involve legislation if you're talking about tax credits, but I think that that's an important aspect of this. In other words, one aspect I already mentioned is that, you know, the Trump administration refused to uh, put out any leases for offshore drilling. Now that'll, I mean, not offshore drilling, for uh, offshore wind. That'll change dramatically. I mean, I see the Biden administration mm -hmm. will, I think, accelerate the process of giving out leases for offshore wind and will be supportive of uh, of the taxes. And, you know, I think that's something like Senator Booker said that is not that crucial that, that you know, uh, that, um, that uh, McConnell would oppose us. So, you know, I think that it's something that we can get as part of a package that would provide more um, help through the tax system uh, for um, renewables, whether it be, uh, whether it be wind or uh, solar. I think that's something that uh, that we could get a consensus. Senator Booker, any, any I'll, thoughts? Just, I'll just add, um, look, this was something we, we were able to win in my first couple of years in the Senate. Uh, we were able to win a deal uh, to really make uh, uh, long-term tax credits, predictable tax credits for uh, wind and solar. And uh, I'm actually hopeful that with allies in the Senate on the other side of the aisle, for example, Chuck Grassley was one of my biggest allies in the fight to try to get a five uh, to seven year predictable um, sort of tax credits uh, at the end of the Obama administration when I first walked, came into the Senate. And so, I, I, you know, there's some possibilities here that deals can be struck uh, in this area. Um, again, uh, there have to be deals that don't have to be horse trading. Some of you might remember that uh, that that horse trading in the Senate involved everything uh, from other non-related to uh, environment tax uh, issues, as well as um, the uh, oil export issues. Uh, um, so um, but I, I think that this is a growing industry in red states as well as so-called blue states. Uh, and so I'm really hopeful that we can actually get something done around, uh, you know, ITC and PTC. Uh, um, for uh, for for the industries. Yeah, that's great to hear. And Senator Booker, you have a bill. It's a environmental justice uh, related. Um, as many folks know, uh, there has been a lot of attention recently on environmental injustice and race justice, and in particular, uh, communities of color seeing more air pollution in their local communities and. Um, one recent study out of Harvard shows that people of color are more likely to have more severe um, sort of symptoms around COVID-19 and a higher death rate because the air quality in their local communities is worse and that exasperates the virus and the, you know, how it works in the human body. Um, so you know, environmental justice and reducing pollution in communities of color is uh, a life and death uh, proposition as we go forward. And you have legislation at the federal level. New Jersey has taken steps at the state level. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what it is that you're looking to accomplish and, um, you know, how folks can help you in that effort? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful that, that you asked me that. And um, uh, we, we really live in a nation where the color of your skin is the greatest predictor of whether you will live around uh, toxicity, whether it's uh, toxic sites or uh, whether you have access to clean air uh, to, to breathe and, and clean water to drink. We are a nation with stunning uh, and unconscionable uh, levels of environmental injustice, um, not only in the state of New Jersey, where you see the cumulative impacts uh, in communities like the one I live in, in Newark, uh, uh, give kids uh, dramatically higher rates of, of lead poisoning or elevated blood lead levels, dramatically higher rates of uh, asthma and respiratory illness, um, uh, as well um, and, as uh, places around this country that I had visited that really were stunning to me. I mean, uh, I, I, from, from Duplin County, where I saw that the uh, corporate agriculture uh, uh, factory farming, uh, first time I ever witnessed um, uh, a CAFO and saw uh, the massive lagoons of feces and had packed rooms of people who wanted to talk to me about the higher respiratory diseases in their communities, how uh, they could, their, their, you know, wells that had been on their grounds were now so poisoned they couldn't drink from them. People who couldn't open their windows, uh, run their air conditioning because the stench around their communities was so awful, couldn't hang their clothing on the line, all the way to places that are known as Cancer Alley, St. James Parish, where I had one of the more moving, painfully wretched meetings of my uh, time in the Senate where I just sat in a black church as people packed in one by one to stand up and tell me how many members of their families had died of cancers uh, because of the chemical companies lining the Mississippi River, uh, all the way to Uniontown, Alabama, where you just see uh, towns like Tallahassee and Uniontown having uh, uh, dumps put into their areas with toxic coal ash and what that has done to the community. So uh, I'm really proud of New Jersey. Uh, we just recently uh, 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 got signed by the governor an environmental justice bill, which is an extraordinary tribute uh, to a lot of our great legislators, as well as the governor himself, but really to grassroots activists uh, who were fighting to do uh, really what I believe are common sense things. Um, uh, like uh, in my federal bill, our state bill requires a consideration of cumulative impact and persistent violations in federal state permitting decisions under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. It looks at that cumulative impact, which is so important in permitting uh, that just by putting something into a community, it in and of itself may not be an environmental disaster. But when you add, to the, add it to the effects of all the other environmental hazards in a community, uh, it definitely is in, in, its, in the totality of its impact. And so uh, my bill on the federal level uh, 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 was a model in, in many ways for a lot of the environmental justice bills we see going on in communities um, throughout our country. But New Jersey really has stepped out with its EJ bill, and I'm very, very uh, grateful for the leaders there. Um, and again, this to me is just common sense, giving the communities more legal standing and the ability to fight back against polluters, um, codifying uh, and expanding a lot of the executive orders we saw uh, 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 under the Clinton administration uh, that gave an environmental justice uh, reporting uh, requirements uh, and making sure uh, that the uh, existing sort of National Environmental Justice Advisory Council and other environmental justice grant programs uh, are, are made uh, permanent and are codified. So uh, the bill does a lot of different things. We wrote it in coordination with New Jersey activists as well as environmental justice advocates around the country. And some of the, when you ask me specifically about what you can do to help, um, number one, we in New Jersey should do everything we can to help our legislation uh, go more viral to the other, uh, other 49 states. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we should try to make sure that when we're having conversations about the urgencies of climate change, that we always talk about environmental justice. Uh, because we all know on this call that as the ravages of climate change could, uh, continue to be felt, it'll be vulnerable communities, disadvantaged communities, and communities of color that will suffer uh, 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 the, 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 a lot of the first and immediate impact, and already are so, as I visited with Native American groups in the Gulf Coast, uh, as well as uh, 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 other minority groups in the rural South, 
who are really suffering from uh, the extreme uh, impact of climate change right now. And then finally, and uh, uh, as, as I said consistently over the last two years, there, there cannot be talk to uh, climate change legislation without making sure that it's inclusive of pillars of environmental justice uh, and, and things that can be done immediately right now. And I know we have to weigh priorities amidst a divided government, uh, but uh, making sure that when we have major infrastructure bills, that as we look towards uh, dealing with climate change, we also look uh, uh, and, and value as environmental activists the urgency of just you know having clean water being an element or replacing lead service pipes uh, being an element of our activism as well. And Ed, yes, if, I, if I could yeah. just add, Ed, I think as the Senator pointed out, I mean, a lot of this uh, uh, in terms of moving on environmental justice, enforcement, grants, that can be done by executive action. I mean, if you remember when, uh, when Lisa Jackson became the head of the EPA under the first uh, Obama-Biden administration, she really highlighted it and, and you know, brought money and did a lot more, uh, paid a lot more attention to environmental justice than had been under the Bush administration. So I think you'll see the same thing here with Biden-Harris. Harris has been a leader like Senator Booker on this issue. And so the EPA now uh, pay a lot more attention to this from an enforcement and also a money point of view. A lot can be done on environmental justice even without legislation. So I think that you could see some major, you know, major switch there over the last four years under Trump. That's through the executive branch rulemaking. Yeah, because this is something that can be done with money with grants, you know, I remember when uh, one of the first things that Lisa Jackson did was she went to the Ramapo there, you know, where they had all that sludge and everything that was in the mines uh, that, and, 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 and they had delisted the Superfund site in the Ramapo and she relisted it again as the EPA administrator. So a lot of the, you know, the, this is an area where executive action, you know, an action by the EPA can make a big difference. So I want to pivot a little bit towards uh, COVID and the COVID crisis, the economy, which I think is really closely linked with the environment and a great way, you know, people are out of work now, um, record unemployment rate, at least, uh, you know, we have folks that are struggling in their home businesses. Some are on their, you know, lifelines. Um, as we think to getting people back to work, uh, one of the things we've been looking at locally with our partners in Rethink Energy, over 20 other environmental groups, is a green jobs recovery. Um, sort of this idea of getting folks back to work in our local communities by doing things like reducing or removing lead service lines, um, restoring natural environments, our estuaries, our coasts, our rivers, doing cleanups um, for toxic sites, capping them so that we can reuse the brown fields for other, other uses into uh, renewable energy, both the production and weatherization and energy efficiency, saving money um, on, our, on our homes. Um, you know, these good green jobs and Anjali sort of asked a little bit about this um, in the chat. Um, you know, what is the appetite for that at the federal level? I mean, it seems like there's going to be some efforts or some spending to help boost the economy, but targeted spending that would help benefit the environment for the next generation and their children's children, um, you know, for lasting implications in the most densely populated state like New Jersey. Any sense, Congressman Pallone? If that's something, either an infrastructure package or you know, part of these conversations, these good green local jobs. Oh, definitely. Look, I, I think that we have to keep up this message that health, safety, jobs, the environment—they all go together. And debunk this myth that somehow, you know, you saw it with COVID, where where Trump was saying, "Well, we have to put, it, we have to open everything up because otherwise the economy is going to go downhill." And Democrats were saying, no, we got to get, we got to crush the virus. Otherwise, you know, we're never going to get the economy back. And the same thing is true here. You, we have to debunk the idea that, uh, that somehow, uh, you know, if we move to renewables or clean energy, that that's going to hurt jobs. It's just the opposite. 
And if anything, uh, one of the most interesting things was that during the whole COVID crisis, even though um, renewable industry suffered, it still continued to grow and the fossil fuel industry continued to go downhill in terms of the number of jobs and the overall you know, value of the industry. So we just have to keep up you know, health, safety, environment, jobs, these all go together. But in going back to what Senator Booker, I think was saying before, you know, this is something where we can get some of the Republicans on our side. And so when we do an infrastructure bill, which is I think one of the major pieces of legislation that we can do, even if the Senate uh, stays Republican, and I still hope that it doesn't, uh, that, uh, you know, around the edges, if you look at an infrastructure bill, you know, you can do a lot with energy efficiency, with resiliency, upgrading the grid, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the Brownfields, which was part of uh, the Moving Forward Act uh, in a major way came out of our committee. That was done, you know, I did that with uh, the Republicans when Whitman was the EPA administrator uh, under Bush. So these types of things are not the kind of, you know, they're not like the high profile things like, you know, the Paris Agreement or something that, that maybe McConnell and the Republican leadership in the House and the Senate will say, no, we don't want to do that. These are things that you could put in an infrastructure bill, efficiency, uh, resiliency, uh, and, and, and green jobs. Because as Senator Booker said, even if you're in Texas, there's a lot of opportunities for wind and solar. Senator Booker, anything uh, you want to add in on that? Uh, I green just want to add, he's, a, he's, a absolute, he's absolutely right. Uh, Congressman Blown is right. There, 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 there are a lot of infrastructure possibilities in the horse trading of some of the larger must pass bills and I and I'm confident we'll do something on infrastructure under the Biden administration. The question is just how large and what to, to what degree. And there are allies, strong allies on the other side of the aisle. I know in the Senate, on the Appropriations Committee, people like Shelby, who I've worked with in the past to try to address some of the environmental and justice issues around water. Um, there are some really great possibilities uh, to do some very good job creating projects that would help us with overall climate change issues as well as environmental justice. Um, you know, one of the things I had in my Climate Steward Act was uh, my dream of recreating something like the Civilian Conservation Corps to plant billions of trees. I know that's an idea uh, from direct dialogue with the incoming administration that, that has, uh, uh, that there's something that they like. And again, as Congressman Cologne rightfully said, there, there's so much power in the office of the presidency, number one, to do things um, through executive action, but number two, uh, to really put legislative priorities uh, up uh, that, uh, that, that can therefore be negotiated um, and win, win games. So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm really hopeful uh, that we can get some things done. And I'm just going to put another thing that I'm hopeful for and I know this has been a, a co-priority with Pop Menendez as well as the chairman, Cologne, is the Superfund sites that we in New Jersey have the most uh, per capita. And uh, the idea that in an infrastructure bill, we can win uh, some of the sort of legacy pollution cleanup uh, efforts that we need. Um, uh, uh, something that I, I, I put together a bill on in, a, in an ambitious way of about $100 billion for brownfield lead remediation. Uh, super funds and those legacy sites, I'm actually hopeful that we can get some of those done as well, because unfortunately for our nation is that these uh, legacy uh, sort of sites uh, from mine, uh, abandoned mines uh, to uh, uh, super fund sites exist in every single state and, and finding uh, sympathy uh, with people on the other side of the aisle is, is very possible. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to create jobs uh, through efforts from cleaning things up to replacing service lines uh, to possibly even some forward thinking things uh, that will help the agricultural industry to sequester carbon or just the sheer planting of. So, 
uh, thank you for that, uh, Senator and Congressman. Um, a lot of people in the chat have been asking questions around fossil fuels, uh, particularly fossil fuel infrastructure. I know at New Jersey LCV Education Fund, we've been working hard on a lot of these battles. Um, the Nessie pipeline uh, would have cut through Raritan Bay. You know, Congressman Blown, you've been outspoken on the Penny's pipeline, et cetera. So I want to turn it over to Tom, um, sort of synthesize those questions that we've been seeing on you know, the, the fossil fuel, particularly natural gas infrastructure, but some, uh, you know, crude oil uh, proposals as they've tried to crisscross New Jersey um, uh, to, to synthesize some of those questions in the box. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Um, so yes, you know, New Jersey, we have found ourselves in the crosshairs of, uh, of numerous uh, interstate gas pipeline proposals, including those that you mentioned, Ed, and, and that those those projects are a real threat to our, our public lands, which they often seem to target, our waterways, uh, our communities, private private homeowners. Um, and and um, you, you have both called attention to the reforms needed at FERC in, in various ways, including the need to better evaluate public, whether there's legitimate public need for some of these projects and to uh, curb the uh, abuse of eminent domain. And I know there are various uh, bills out there uh, that, that uh, begin to bring some of these ideas forward. Congressman Malinowski, uh, Senator Wyden, Senator Kane. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether you think um, such reforms have the potential to move forward in the, in the next Congress or, or any of these issues uh, possibly have the potential for, uh, for you know, bipartisan support. And I was going to ask Senator Booker to go first because I know we're going to lose his connection um, via the cell. So I don't know if you wanted to share a response to that and some closing thoughts before you jump off, Senator Booker. Look, um, I, I've always tried to make sure uh, that FERC does what it's supposed to do, you know, evaluating projects as they impact on the environment. And uh, again, as I said earlier, there's a lot of the, from FERC to just, you know, the, the broad efforts of the EPA, you've seen them go down dramatically under, under the Trump administration uh, in terms of just their overall enforcement. Uh, they're, they're holding, a, they're literally, you measure the billions of dollars left collected from large scale corporate polluters. Um, so I, 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 again, as I said earlier, I'm very bullish on uh, our, our ability through the administration, especially one with as enlightened and, um, a bold sort of environmental vision as the, the uh, Biden-Harris team, it gives me a lot of hope in these areas uh, and more. Um, we need to make sure that any large projects are done in our state and beyond really uh, um, are actually needed before they go forward. Um, I think that we have to continue to bring awareness around the fossil fuel industry and their efforts just to expand access. I, I, go, I keep going back to the battles we've had off the Atlantic coast, for example. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping there'll be a great deal of activism in this space um, and that it's going to it, and that it's going to really help us uh, sort of on the offensive side to, to, to stop uh, uh, some malactions before they even happen. Um, again, I, I know I have to jump off, um, but uh, clearly the, the back side of this is that we try to be stopping certain projects from going forward. It really is uh, continuing to expand uh, possibilities for our country in the renewable space. Uh, I, I just continue as, I, as I, I try to stay up to date about innovations, breakthroughs, and possibilities when it comes to a green future. It's just really exciting uh, to see the possibilities for us to really win uh, the, the global battle against climate change. And for us as a nation, and even state innovators here in New Jersey, for us to really help to lead that the, the way out. And from looking at everything from our massively broken corporate uh, industrial food se sector, which is uh, such a major part of climate change, from deforestation uh, to the uh, production of methane, uh, which is so much more toxic uh, to our, uh, or excuse me, so much more potent to uh, uh, climate change, uh, uh, than uh, other forms of carbon production. So I just, I just, uh, I'm hopeful uh, as, as I look to the future, even though I've been really uh, sobered over these last um, uh, couple of weeks since the election, 
about uh, about uh, the, the, the situation in the Senate, I'm still really hopeful. And the last thing that gives me a lot of hope is just the awareness of Americans uh, on, on, on climate change and the urgency to do something about it. Uh, and a lot of it, unfortunately, has is, is, is been because of the, the fires and the flooding and the sea level riding in places like Florida are making people realize uh, for their own economic interests and health interests that this is something that we have to do something about or things are going to continue to grow worse. And then there's some uh, of this is motivated by a whole new generation of activists that we see uh, globally that are uh, G- Generation Z that are really leading uh, a movement of, of enlightenment in our, in our uh, globally. So there's a lot of factors that give hope despite uh, disappointing elections uh, in terms of the Senate. Uh, but I just want to say uh, one of the things that is a bedrock source of my hope are the organizations, activists, and leaders on this call who've been such extraordinary partners of mine. Uh, and I just want to take this moment to say thank you uh, for uh, being such a great partner. I'm so excited and grateful that the people of New Jersey has given me uh, another six years uh, to lead and fight on these issues. And my hope and prayer is that together, uh, over the next six years, we will create a revolution in terms of, of, uh, of outcomes and possibilities, uh, not just in stemming uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, better establishing our ideals of justice for everyone. Uh, um, uh, and the urgencies that are facing, especially low-income and black and brown communities. So thank you, everybody. And uh, again, I just want to thank my partner in the House of Representatives, one of our great national leaders, Congressman uh, Pallone, and and one of New Jersey's treasures. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We stand uh, ready to work with you arm in arm in all these endeavors. We uh, congratulate you on your re-election and and wish you the best. Stay safe. Um, Congressman Pallone. Thank you. Congress Pallone, thoughts on, uh, you know, the pipeline battles and FERC and any other thoughts in response to what you heard from uh, Senator Booker? Sure. I don't know if he uh, hears me anymore, but I wanted to congratulate him again, too, for all the great job he, he's done, you know, over the years on environmental and so many other issues. Um, well, I think that, uh, look, the uh, in terms of the changes at FERC or I mean, really all federal agencies, I mean, the problem we faced under the Trump administration was that Trump was constantly trying to impose his ideology and his policy on what's supposed to be independent agencies. I mean, in theory, FERC, FTC, FDA, FCC, these are all supposed to be independent agencies. And Trump just used this heavy hand. In fact, within the last couple of days, he removed the chairman. I mean, I wasn't a big uh, fan of Chatterjee, but I guess what he did is he he was trying, he he did a lot of work on integrating renewable energy and energy storage and electricity grid. And he obviously wasn't acceptable to Trump, so he removed him. So I think one of the major things we'll see is that not only that these agencies, you know, go back to their original uh, sort of independent ability, and I think that makes for a more open process so that if you want to go before FERC and ask them to take a position against the pipeline, against a, a large transmission project, which we also had in, uh, in, uh, in my district that we had to fight, uh, that um, they're more open uh, to the public and they're not just being, you know, uh, making decisions or not being transparent because of the president who's telling them, who's trying to impose his ideology. So that's a, that's a big change. Um, just in terms of dealing with individual projects, in my opinion, they'll be more responsive. But in addition to that, yeah, I mean, well, there are some changes that we need to make, and we've talked to FERC about those changes so that there's a more open process and more opportunity for the public and more attention to some of these uh, projects, whether it be pipelines or high transmission lines that are not necessary. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there's going to be a sea change there, and we might be able to get some um, you know, I don't know if we can get legislation because, again, that goes back to, you know, what we can get through a Republican Senate. But we can certainly get some changes in terms of more public input and ability to understand, um, um, you know, I, I keep thinking of the transmission lines. Uh, I don't know how much you guys are probably not involved in that so much, but we had this proposal for this very expensive high transmissions line. And it was obvious that, that the uh, that the um, 
you know, that there wasn't a lot of input from the public, but then eventually we did win. Um, and that's a perfect example of getting FERC, for example, to be more responsive. Yeah, and there, you know, there are a lot of these battles, uh, you know, we've been involved in as well with the transmission line we did uh, enter into. Uh, most recently, New Jersey Transit Grid, which is New Jersey Transit, was building its own power station on fracked gas. And you know, now they're looking at a renewables uh, alternative. Um, we're not sure it's going to be 100% there with renewables, which would be unfortunate. So we're going to keep on advocating and then the Meadowlands power plant. Um, you know, but all of this infrastructure, you know, the gas pipelines, et cetera, um, you know, we already know we have enough of the gas we need well into the future. We don't need any new um, pipelines, but yet part the of it, poor industry is pushing it. Yeah. What we've seen is that the industry pushes these things because they make money. And it yeah, may they not, make money and a lot what? of times it's not something that, that I mean, not that we're going to forget about the environmental aspects, but sometimes it's not even something that's needed in terms of new growth uh, for the economy at all, right? In other yeah. words, you know, they want to build the pipeline, we don't need the gas. They want to build a high transmission line, we don't need the extra electricity. So yeah. I just think that FERC has been very corporate, and hopefully that I think it will change under this administration and hopefully they become more independent of whoever's uh, the president, which is the way it's supposed to be. Well, and so I think, you know, as we round out here, this has been a really great conversation. We could continue. I have lots of questions coming up. We have, you know, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you know, there's a couple minutes left. Are there any closing thoughts you want to leave to the people who are participating? This is also recorded. We're going to share it out. Some folks had conflicts, other work, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, things that they had responsibilities for during this hour. Um, you know, to sort of sum up, what is it that you want to make sure people are aware of and how can they help? Obviously, we are all sharing in our commitments to protect the environment. Uh, what ways can people that are, are hearing today and being part of this join in our efforts to advance uh, the cleanest air, water and land as possible? Well, I just think that we, you don't, Ed, and Tom doesn't, but I think a lot of people underestimate uh, their ability to make a difference, right? And that's why transparency is so important, right? I mean, I always, I want to, you know, my, not to take away from our two senators, because I love them, but, you know, my hero has always been Senator Lautenberg, because, and one of the things he always talked about was the, the right to know. In other words, that if we have laws on the books or we have executive action rules on the book that let people know what's going on, uh, then, then they can make decisions and influence what goes on in Washington or Trenton themselves and they don't necessarily have to have their legislator as the intervener and i think that's the most important thing you you what so many people turned out in this last election because they thought that the election made a difference and it did and i want to stress the same thing you know keep up your activism it does make a difference and i do believe that with the, the change of administration uh that that transparency and openness and ability to enter to, uh, to influence what goes on becomes even easier. So I'm optimistic in terms of your activism and your ability to, and the public's ability to, to make change. That's uh, good for the environment, good for consumers and good for public health. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks again. Agreed, and thank you so very much um, for your time, for your continued um, leadership, uh, always being available um, you know, to talk about these important issues. Um, for all of you who joined us, uh, I wanna say thank you to Henry, um, of the staff behind this, and Hillary and Patty, thank you. Tom, our partner at Rethink Energy, uh, LCV in DC. Uh, none of this would be possible without you. If you're interested in getting more involved, Patty put up a link um, to sign up to volunteer and work with us on uh, legislation at the state and federal level. We need everyone that we can um, in this fight. This work is never easy, every, even when the stars align, as you know, Congressman. So um, we're hopeful that the stars continue to align, but we stand ready to continue to do the hard work, um, whatever the situation is, to protect what is so important for our children and grandchildren and it's our environment. And um, we couldn't do it with anyone better than you. So we're really, really grateful for your time today and, and your leadership. Thanks so much. Thank you. Everyone be well and safe, okay? Thanks everyone.